This is a makeup lecture, um, and we are looking at measuring the economy, um, particularly using stocks and flows. Now, the first and most important thing to understand is that measurement in economics is really hard. Um, the, it's not like physics or, 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 or atmospherics or, or something like or chemistry, where you can get a really good level of precision about your data. The data difficulties are huge. Um, most of the data that we use are not actually collected for the purposes of economic analysis. They're actually collected to, uh, you know, record who's paying taxes or something like that. So this forces us to be careful about the quality of our knowledge. The most important thing I think I can teach you is that you need to be skeptical about the quality of economic knowledge and the quality of the predictions that come from this. Okay, so low quality prediction low quality information generally leads us to low quality testable properties of our models the truth about it is that if the model if the, even if the model is brilliant if the data going into it is rubbish then it, it, the predictability of what you can get out of that is actually pretty low and this noisy data and low quality data tends to lead to difficulties in reducing the errors within our models the reason is quite simple um, if the data is poor you don't know if it's the data that's the problem or the model so we can't reduce the error in the model because we're not sure about the data. Um, now, there are experiments that you can do economics, but in this case, it's much more difficult. And this is, it forces us to make very simplistic assumptions about the models. You know, we have to assume they're linear or the distributions are normal and so forth. And so you must be very, very careful about the quality of your information and the predictions you can make from it. So we measure loads of things. Um, a lot of the time we don't find anything out. We want to know about things like economic growth or money or population change or debt levels or credit provision or interest rates, regulations, taxes, all of this stuff, right? We want to know about all this. And to the extent that we can know anything about it, we have to be collecting data. Um, now you must understand the circular flow model, which essentially begins at the top here with the government. Um, so you've got, well, not the government, sorry. You've got households that transfer their labor and the capital that they have to businesses. Businesses pay rent, wages, rents, and stuff like that to households. Households pay taxes to the government. Businesses pay taxes to the government. And the government transfers stuff back to other households. Um, the, you can see that there are kind of injections and withdrawals. So you can households take out savings, imports, and taxes. This goes through the government, ends up to business. Similarly, imports go to the rest of the world. Savings become investment by going through the capital markets and meanwhile you have income and consumption and this notion of the flows and stocks of goods it's very important yeah well we can look at it as a balance sheet um so here's a national income matrix which essentially defines the uses and sources of funds um and what you can see here is households consume some amount c and they get it from this is a monetary amount so they consume like a, a hundred units of you know apples and then they get that from the, the, the businesses that shows up as current expenditure. The government spends money um, and they get they spend it on businesses here. Businesses invest, that becomes in their capital account. You can see that the total sums to zero in the, in the rows and in some of the columns it sums. You can see if you look down the columns, households consume, that's what they do, they spend money, but they get it. Some of them get money from wages, other get some money from profits some of them pay taxes the difference is saving okay here the difference between current and capital will give you investment and the difference between here will give you the government surplus and deficit and if you add in um, an import and export market you have the three balances which is that government expenditure minus taxes is the first balance the second balance is saving minus investment and the third balance is exports minus imports here are Ireland's assets and liabilities at the end of 2010. What you can see very quickly is that the assets here are actually pretty low quality. Um, cash, non-bank, national pension reserve fund, financial assets, and the investment in the banks. Which will just There's no chance of that ever get, us getting 9.4 billion back from these, th this investment. Meanwhile, the government borrowing securities, 116 billion, promissory notes to Anglo-Irish Bank, five to Irish Nationwide, some money to ESB, and you can see that the balance sheet is not looking too good in 2010. And of course, the bonds issued in NAMA and the loan assets of NAMA, quote unquote, off the books. Here you see the increase in government consumption from 2005, percentage change, all the way up to 2009. 
what you see really is that the, this is peaking. So in other words, government expenditure increased by 6.9% from 2004 to 2005. You can see it increases all the way to 2007 and then it becomes negative. Similarly for government expenditure, here increases, 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 and then begins to decrease in 2009. Investment, massive increase, nearly 15% in 2005, followed by a complete collapse of 31% in 2009. It's not a typo. Um, exports have kept pretty constant. Imports have fallen apart in sort of 2009, 2010. You can see GDP dropping from 162 to 159. And GNP, which is a better measure of the domestic economy, has dropped from 138 to 131 and dropped by 10.7% in this particular year. So there's a flow way of looking at the macroeconomy, which is essentially to think of the flow of money or blood around the system. C plus I plus G, so consumption plus investment plus government expenditure, is equal to Y, which is national income or output or expenditure. And that's just the wage bill plus taxes and plus profits, if you want to put that in there too. I, I really like this. Quote, another feature of macroeconomic models which can be associated with the principle of effective demand is that market clearing through prices does not usually occur except in pri financial markets. The real markets, those for products and labour, are assumed to be demand-led. Full employment of labour is not assumed, nor is full employment of capacity, although in the later chapters of our book, where the possibility of inflation is introduced, high levels of unemployment will be assumed to generate inflationary pressures. It's quite an interesting idea. So you've seen this before. This is the supply and demand model. I'm not going to go through it too much, except to note that I've put price on its proper axis for once. Um, so Godley and Navarre are saying that the supply and demand model really doesn't work. Um, and if it doesn't work, then you need to think about stocks as well as flows. Meadows, um, Donella Meadows in 2001, in an amazing book called Thinking and Systems, a primer, said... If information-based relationships are hard to see, and remember, the price of a good is, is, is a very important piece of information. Functions or purposes are even harder. A system's function or purpose is not necessarily spoken, written, or expressed explicitly, except through the operation of the system. The best way, and this is such a cool quote, the best way to deduce the system's purpose is to watch for a while to see how the system behaves. So obviously I'm going to talk to you about bathtubs. Um, a stock is the foundation of any system. The important thing to understand when you're talking about stocks is to have the metaphor right. Um, the stock is a buffer or the memory of the system of changing flows. Uh, so if you understand how stocks and flows behave, in other words, they're changing over time, their dynamics, you can understand how this system behaves. Um, and of course, the bathtub is a great example. So think about a bathtub for a second. What you have really is a, is a large container um, and you f into which flows water there's a certain amount of water in the tub a stock of water and then there's an outflow that goes down the, the, the sink thing the drain thing um, so importantly if the sum of all inflows the water coming in exceeds the sum of all outflows because you've plugged up the stopper you've stopped up the plug rather um, the level of stock is going to rise the vice the, the, the contrary is also true and the sum of all outflows equals the sum of all inflows and the stock level doesn't change. It's in a dynamic equilibrium. So that's when you stop, you stop the tap from running. GDP or GNP are actually flow measures. Stocks will change slowly. You can think about inventories. You can think about um, populations. They're stocks. They change slowly over time. Um, they delay or buffer the various shocks the system sees. And time lags come from slowly changing systems. Uh, can cause various problems in systems, but they can also be large sources of stability. So the, if the bathtub thing is too pedestrian for you, think about interest-bearing accounts in banks or balance sheets. The total amount of money in the account is the stock. It's the bathtub level, basically. And then the bank basically decides how much money you'll earn based on the uh, total stock you have. So the total euros of interest paid into the account each year to flow in is not a fixed amount but it varies with the total in the account. So the stock influences the flow and vice versa. And, you know, here's the same idea. Here's the money that flows, flowed out, then into, flowed into, and then out of the Irish economy in terms of uh, deposits and liabilities over the last um, eight or nine years. Now, if you're talking about stocks and flows, you have to think about feedbacks. A feedback loop is 
a closed chain of causal connection. So I consume more, that gives you more income, or my disposable income goes up, therefore I consume more. There's a feedback, yeah? Through a set of decisions or rules or feed physical laws that are dependent on the level of the stock and back again. So this is the feedback effect. So one really nice example of feedbacks is the banks, the international banks go get very scared after the collapse of Lehman Brothers. They contract the interbank market and the credit crunch happens. That slows business investment and economic growth. That hammers the fiscal um, the, the fiscal situation, hurts the government. That undermines the guarantees and new funding, which causes a contraction of credit and obviously country level insolvency. So there's feedback effects all over the place. Nobel laureate Jan Tinbergen mentioned this circularity about the economic system. He said, here we meet a very important feature. It would seem as, as if this was, were circular reasoning. Profits fell because investment fell, and investment fell because profits fell, because there's a feedback effect there. There are also feedbacks in wages. The more prices go up, the more wages have to go up if people maintain their living standards. The more wages go up, the more prices have to go up. They maintain profits, so wages go up and prices go up and so forth. So there's this in a nice dynamic. If you just look down here, which are, the red line is uh, labor costs. So you can think about this as the change in wages. And uh, the blue line here is the CPI, the, the um, change in inflation. You can see what happens is the CPI drops first, followed by the change in you know, labor costs. There's, there's a feedback between wages and prices. This feedback is called the Phillips curve. And the idea of the Phillips curve, quite simply, is that it shows the relationship between the change in inflation and the change in unemployment. The feedback comes from government spending. If the government spends more money, then it can um, hire more workers. That'll decrease unemployment. But if these people are all, un all employed, they'll all go off and spend more money. In a tight labor market, wages will go up, and that'll lead to increases in inflation. Phillips actually was an engineer and he had this idea that he wanted to control the economy. He wanted to apply feedback control methods to the stabilization of the economy. And the only, the only actor big enough to do that was the government. So he showed this idea using data for, for the English economy, the British economy actually. Um, and in the 60s, Solo and Samuelson replicated these findings for the US. And so the Phillips curve method, this idea that you have lower unemployment coming in some sense as a, as a trade off uh, at the cost of higher inflation this I, this trade off idea um this became very much part of the orthodoxy in economics and then they got the head kicked off it by two guys called uh, Edmund Phelps and um Milton Friedman who said well okay look inflation today has to have some kind of expectational component they said right it's got to be inflation yesterday minus the expected change in unemployment times some speed of adjustment you know so inflation today might be Expect inflation tomorrow minus the expected change in employment times the speed and adjustment. They, they had this idea of an expectation augmented Phillips curve. And you can see that the Phillips curve for Ireland is pretty rubbish in, a, in its linear um, uh, uh, version. You can also see, by the way, the, the influence or the, the change that the last few years, which I've colored in red, have brought on us. They've really knocked the unemployment inflation uh, thing out of whack. It's very much the economics of a depression when all the little rules fly away. You can see that there's vast changes, vast differences in European unemployment from the core to the periphery. There are different types of loops. There are balancing loops where one effect will balance out another, plus in one column, minus in another. Reinforcing loops. If a reinforcing loop is, is very is highly positive, then it becomes explosive. If it's um, not not very positive, but it's quite small, then it becomes a kind of a dampening loop. There are competing loops where one kind of works against the other, um, and then you can also have competing loops that are also balancing loops. So I, I like this. Um, in the 1950s, um, Phillips actually built a machine to describe his economy, because he was an engineer. He called it Moniac, and uh, recently guys have come together to actually rebuild it. And here's an example of Moniac in work. Or actually not, because this is a PDF. So uh, we looked at the relationship between the volume of water in the bathtub through time when the plug is pulled and it goes like that, straight down. I'll put the uh, Phillips curve thing up on YouTube. In the case of a coffee cup, you can see the dynamic equilibrium if it, here, here's the boiling cup of coffee, it comes, it cools down, whereas iced coffee, which is nearly freezing, heats up. So there's a kind of a dynamic equilibrium 
and where you where you re- where in fact what happens is that the heat in the cup of coffee relaxes to the room temperature and similarly the heat the lack of heat in the iced coffee relaxes to the regular room temperature over time what's the lesson stocks change over time as a result of the actions of a flow and dynamic equilibrium exists where the rate of change of a stock is equal to the rate of change of a flow so obviously here's a flow new house units built you can see it built up over time very rapidly from the, through the 90s and then completely collapsed 2009 so in summary is the macro economy a set of loops absolutely um great example the greater the stock of physical capital the more uh, um, output can be produced so productivity and output are linked they're looping um, the more education there is the more productive people will be and so forth and again the more output that's produced the more can be reinvested to make new capital so it's kind of a reinforcing loop so thank you very much